Welcome to The Selling Show, where we unpack, repack, and break down exactly how top experts sell their ideas, their value, and their services. This is your host, David Newman, and you are in the right place if you want better clients, bigger deals, and higher fees. You know, sometimes on The Selling Show, we have a guest, the lowercase g. Sometimes we have a guest with a capital G. And I am pleased to say Mr. Greg Roworth is here from Business Flight Path. And I am super excited, Greg, because you are absolutely a capital G guest. Well, thank you, David. I appreciate the thoughts. So you are a professional services and specifically consulting firm marketing expert, correct? Well, that's probably true, although I wouldn't claim to be a marketing expert, but my experience goes back over 25 years of having started, grown, and sold three professional service firms of my own. Well, let's talk about that. So I would love to start. Give us just a quick tour of the professional journey that brought you to the work that you're doing today. And then we have lots of good, juicy topics to dig into that just mm. kind of mano a mano will we'll solve the world's problems right here in the next 35 minutes. Okay, sounds great. Yes, well, I started out my working life as an accountant and had no idea about marketing, never expected to be in sales. <laughs> in fact, I was so shy. I used to go into shops and walk around trying to find what I was looking for rather than ask someone for help. So to ever think that I would get involved in selling and marketing was just not on the radar. However, (laughs) I got bitten by the entrepreneurial bug and decided to start up in business for myself and to address how do I get clients. Naturally, I looked for a lot of help. I read a lot of books, as you can see behind me, (laughs) a bit like your bookcase as well. Right. And most of those books are related to marketing and sales. And also, you know, re- uh, employed or engaged marketing consultants to help me on the way. What I found that most of the money I spent on marketing was just like gambling. It was, you know, a hope that the money I spent would turn into, you know, revenue from new clients. But most of the time that didn't happen. So being a persistent character, I and you know, being a consultant whose mantra is there's got to be a better way, I put my mind to the issue of you know, how do I get clients consistently and predictably and did a lot of research and reading and came up with a, a method that started to generate new leads and new clients fairly consistently. And really what I do now is related to my journey of what I call being the strategic authority in the market, you know, having a specific target market that I create a strategic profile of being the authority in that market. And you know, now that you know, I've had over 25 years of experience in growing professional service firms and being able to sell them, someone suggested to me once I, I sold my last business that maybe it'd be a good idea to help other consultants learn how to grow a business that they could sell as well. So that's really what I focus on now. Let's dive into that. I want to eat dessert first and talk about this concept of the saleable Mm. firm. I think I read this on your website that you help folks go from growth to scalable to saleable. Was that your line? From struggle to survival, to scalable, to saleable. There we go. So Mm -hmm. walk us through those four stages when a consultant or a trainer or even a firm comes to you at any of those four stages, map out what they look like, what the symptoms Mm -hmm. are at each of those stages, and then what they might want to work on to help them get to the next stage. Well, most of us, when we start our business as a consultant or a professional, you know, start up in the occupation that we have our expertise in. So that occupation level is generally where it's a struggle to find clients. And we have to focus on learning the strategy around client acquisition. And a lot of 
professionals never actually achieve that strategy. They never focus on that strategy and rely on getting referrals or you know going to networking meetings late at night and you know, when they'd rather be home with their family. So you know, it's a continual struggle until they get that strategy right. But when they get that strategy right around client acquisition, they can then move into being a business operator. You know, the demand from clients creates an opportunity to grow the business and they tend to employ other people and create a business that they're operating. But that generally just takes them to a level of survival where they reach a plateau where they bump along around the same revenue level each year because they haven't really designed the business with intent to grow. And let me interrupt real quick because this is totally fascinating. In your experience, having helped hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of consultants and professional services firms, because I would love people listening to recognize themselves Mm -hmm. in this progression. So is there a demarcation point like between struggling and survival? You know, here in the U.S., we say it's about $100,000 a year. That once you cross that 100K per year, okay, you know, you built yourself a job. Mm -hmm. Is it really a business yet? No. And then the next level and the next level. Where do you see those demarcation points revenue-wise? Yeah, well, typically at at that point, it's around 100,000 to maybe 200,000. You know, when they start employing people, you know, around 100,000 K level. And in Australia, that's probably a fairly low figure as a professional. You know, most professionals here would earn 150 K or more. However, in their own business, it's a struggle to get to that level. So a lot of professionals, you know, who are working for a firm would be paid that, start their own business and maybe never, ever get to that level again. The ones that do get to that level then you know, start have enough revenue to employ other people and may be able to grow their business up to around 500K with two or three employees. But you know, that may be the limit of their growth. So they're at survival level and you know, continue to survive. But because they haven't really developed the right structure to grow the business to the next level, which I call being the business orchestrator rather than the business operator, getting the structure right where they can start to run a business that works for them instead of being the one that has to make the business work, they will never break through that barrier. So the key point at this level is to have a mindset flip to become the business orchestrator, to look at, well, how do we actually grow a proper business that provides freedom and prosperity rather than being the potential trap that traps the owner in hard work and effort and headaches trying to manage a business that has a high level of demand that they really can't cope with because they don't plan the growth successfully. Yeah. So that mindset flip means that they have to start to think about, you know, how do they create a business that works for them instead of being the one that makes the business work. So being the business operator then helps them become scalable when they develop the systems, you know, methodologies in the business that differentiates them from other competitors in the market, but also provides the training and systemization for their employees to start to be able to run the business for the owners and and do the day-to-day work, do the delivery work for clients so that the owner can extract themselves from that position. And even a lot of larger firms at this point still don't break through that barrier because they just have more partners and they grow a business that is, you know, a lot of silos with partners, you know, being the ones that make their silo work. So even a larger consulting firm doesn't necessarily become a business that works for the owners because of that typical structure that a lot of consulting firms have that doesn't actually free them to run a proper business. So, you know, that mindset flip has to come into place. So they systemize the business so that becomes scalable. And ultimately, you know, the differentiation and the the marketing systems can deliver them to a level of market supremacy where they become the business overseer and have a saleable business. 
Holy smoke, so much value in this episode. Listen, if you are loving what you're hearing, feel free to download, subscribe, tell a friend, leave a review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you're listening to The Selling Show. Now, back to the interview. So tell me a little bit about when you say systems, and you know, there's all sorts of advice about systems and documentation and procedures mm-hmm. and standard operating procedures. Mm-hmm. Is that a central part of this that we need to sort of document and things like job descriptions, mm-hmm. roles and responsibilities so that we move away from, you know, Jerry does this and Greg does that and David does mm-hmm. this, but we really build the organization chart of this machine And this machine can run with you or without you as long as there's competent people in every box. That's it, absolutely. At that level, the systems need to document the responsibilities of people, how things are done, and how to train people to do things the right way as well. It's not just about the operations manual. It's it's almost creating a franchisable business. And that's another level of saleability. You know, you don't right. necessarily have to sell the whole business, but you could sell franchises or licenses by having the right training systems in place as well. And getting to that level means that, yeah, everything needs to be professional business and the same as a you know, corporate level business with the systems and processes and procedures in place. I think a lot of people get the order wrong and sometimes people at the business operator level think we need systems in place, but because the business is in a chaotic state a lot of times, and you know, a big mistake I see a lot of professional firms make is that they provide a huge range of services that they're capable of providing, but because they provide it to a huge range of different types of clients, they actually introduce a lot of complexity in their business into you know, we do all these things. So every new client means we've got to redesign how we work for that particular client. So there's no ability to scale that process. So if we try to systemize what we do at that level, we're systemizing a whole lot of inefficient processes and inefficient operations. Right. So you know, the focus needs to be getting the structure right so that you have the people in place to be able to grow. But then at the next level, once you create the strategy around differentiation and what I call a focused specialization, then you can actually simplify the business in terms of the services that you offer and run the business very efficiently and then yeah. systemize the efficient operations rather than you know, have a whole bunch of inefficient systems in place. For sure. Well, I want to just change gears for one quick moment because. I think this is something that is so critically important and many, many, many professional services get this wrong as well. And I saw something on your website that sparked this question. Client selection Mm -hmm. is going to be my question. So when we try and be all things to all people, we get clients who are below the criteria that we like to work on. We get clients who are above the criteria Mm -hmm. that we like to work on, our sweet spot, if you will. Mm -hmm. We get clients that are way far to the left and way far to the right. And we say, man, I've got, you know, out of my 20 clients right now, I've got three that are amazing, awesome, fantastic. I wish I could clone them, but they never go back to their marketing. They never go back to their messaging. They never go back to the language that they're using to attract these people. Because if you're getting wrong fit clients, it's about wrong messaging that you're broadcasting out to the world. Most professional service firms and most principals, I'm guessing, Greg, when they work with you, they can't see this. You can see it plain as the mm-hmm. nose on their face. Yeah. They can't see it because like, oh, we've always worked with this kind mm-hmm. of person. It's like, but do you enjoy them? Not particularly. Are they your best clients? Not especially. Are they your most profitable projects? Not usually. And then they're like, what are you thinking? So Mm. talk to me about inadvertently broadcasting the kind of marketing and sales messaging that brings in all the wrong clients and how you recommend people fix it. Yeah, that's a great point, David. And it's one of the biggest mistakes I've seen 
in the limited amount of marketing that most professional service firms do. And I think there's a almost a fear of limiting their focus to the premium clients that I call them. You know, it's like, well, if we limit our, our uh, marketing down to a few, look at all these opportunities we're going to miss. <laughs> so is that, you know, inability to see that if they did focus on just those three clients and try to attract more clients like them, they actually have to tone down their messaging. They have to water it down, you know, so it's they think more appealing to more people and in fact, it becomes generic and ineffective. So yeah. the, the, the languaging and the you know what I call platitudes that I see on a lot of people's websites about what they do doesn't actually land for their ideal clients. And the messaging just sounds generic and like, you know, if they check the websites of all the competitors, they're probably saying exactly the same things. So, you know, when a potential client comes along and has a need for a service and they start looking at the websites well who do they choose from there's a whole range of people and what I see at that level and sometimes they they're potentially great clients but the client has the control in the negotiations because they see oh here's maybe three or four companies that could provide the services you know let's get proposals for more of them and put them in a competitive situation so what I see and I, I talk to my clients about is in that situation, they're the servant, you know, and they're a service business. Yeah. So that's yeah. almost a natural state for them to be in. But as the servant, you know, the master, uh, their client has the control. You know, master tells the servant what to do, you know, how much they'll pay them. <laughs> and usually the servant gets paid a pretty low rate. So my philosophy is about being the saviour rather than the servant. So positioning yourself as the saviour. Now, you've got a solution that is unique to that particular client's needs. And if they see that you have a unique solution for them, they come to you saying, can you please help us? And we'll pay you whatever it takes. Yes. So this reminds me, this is such a great conversation, Greg. So thank you for sharing your brilliance on this. In my Do It Marketing book, I tell a story about specialization and there was a catering. The story I tell is about a catering truck. So there's a catering truck that is literally still in my neighborhood here in suburban Philadelphia. And on the side of the catering truck, it says, you know, XYZ catering. We specialize in private and corporate events. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking to myself, what else is there in the world of catering? It's either a private event or it's a corporate event. There's nothing in between. And I say, if I were looking for a caterer for my daughter's wedding, would I go to XYZ Catering? We specialize in private and corporate events. Or would I go to Wedding Bells Catering, making sure your magic day is memorable forever. Something like that. I'm making up a terrible slogan for them. <laughs> so clearly, if you want to dominate the wedding catering business, you got to be loud and proud on the side of the truck, the name of the company, the positioning, the messaging, the emails, the social media. Everything needs to say, we are the go-to caterers if your wedding is important. If your wedding is not important, Go to Burger King. Doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. So many people are afraid of specializing. You know this. I know this. I'd love you to talk about this. It's not like, oh, I'm going to be bored. Mm -hmm. You know, Greg, the reason I, I don't want to follow your advice, I'm afraid I'm going to be bored. And they don't understand that what they get to exchange here, they get to exchange breath for depth. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And when you go deep, it is so much more fun and so much more fascinating. Speak to that for a little bit. Uh, yes, you've nailed it. It's a critical area I see, you know, for most consulting firms and professional services generally is that, you know, on their website, they talk about themselves and what they do. You know, here's their range of services, but there's no indication on who those services are provided for. You know, who are the ideal clients for them? One of the biggest challenges for 
anyone doing marketing is getting attention, that style of marketing just gets no attention at all. Yeah. Yeah, unless someone knows absolutely that they need a particular service, then they're pretty unlikely you know, to be attracted to that website. And you know, most consultants, I think, you know, have a, a service that solves a problem, but the potential clients don't actually know what the solution to that problem is. You know, they're all problem aware, so they know what their problem is, but they're not necessarily actually looking for a solution at that point. So what I see, you know, the way to get attention for consultants is to be very specific about what problem they solve and who they solve it for. And if they can promote that on their website, you know, we solve XYZ problem for ABC clients. If someone sees that, says, wow, that's us, and we've got that problem, I better read more. You know, so that's the way to get attention, you know, to be focused on what problem you solve and who are the ideal clients that you solve it for and be promoting to those people rather than the generic broad statements of here's the range of services that we offer. Hope that suits you. <laughs> right, exactly. Well, you mentioned about website and you know what we see on LinkedIn, social mm-hmm. media, websites, things like that. The big fear, and what I don't want people leaving this interview thinking, is that posting content or having a great website is enough. Because we hear this a lot, right? I'm sure you hear this a lot. Greg, we have an amazing website. It is crystal clear. How come people don't hire us off the website? Mm. Greg, we're posting on LinkedIn every single week. We post our little hearts out. No one's calling. No one's emailing. No one's messaging us. I think consultants in particular, and any sort of professional services firm, feel that somehow their services should sell themselves. That menu that you Mm -hmm. talked about, Well, they see the menu, if they need any of these things, I'm sure they'll call. As opposed to proactive, trusted advisor, high relationship style outreach, Mm -hmm. why are consultants so allergic to outreach? Mm. I think in a way it comes back to a bit of a legacy of how consultants traditionally have gained business. And that has been through referrals. And you know, in a lot of professions, advertising was never a thing. In fact, most professionals weren't allowed to advertise until maybe the last 15, 20 years. So, you know, I think the sales style and the selling mode has always been get a referral, have a sales meeting, take two, three meetings to talk to someone and convince them of the need for the services, put in a proposal and hope that the client buys. So the process I see is that when we have to become marketers of our services and not rely on referrals, we need to extend the process from, you know, the sales meeting. In the typical process, you know, the sales meeting is probably 90% of the process or the sales function. Now, we have to broaden out and create a, a marketing process that brings clients to us at the same level of trust that a referral comes to us with, you know, because referrals have a lot of trust built in because of that referral process. So if we get clients coming to us without that same level of trust, the sales process is pretty difficult. So I liken the process to, well, marketing based on normal human relationship building practices and based on a book by Desmond Morris called Intimate Behavior, where he studied the behavior of primates and humans, and he identified 12 steps to intimacy. What we need to do in our marketing is create the steps to intimacy. And I see that there's probably six steps in the process for marketing. We can combine a couple of those steps But what he identified in that process of 12 steps of intimacy is that if someone tries to rush those or skip a number of steps to try to get to the end point quicker than they might normally do it, that creates resistance and often is the end of a relationship. 
So often with the sales and marketing process, I see people trying to skip to the end point, skip to the sale, which isn't really the end point. It's really, you know, maybe not quite the end, but, you know, we have a longer term relationship to build once we have the sale, you know, but trying to jump to the sale too quickly creates a lot of resistance and, you know, often leads to the end of a relationship before it even starts. So building the relationship building processes into our marketing by having a smaller series of steps. And I call the first one, which is not my original term, but you know, it's a marketing term that most people know about entering the conversation that's already in the mind of the buyer. We have to create content at that level. And that can be short content because people have shorter attention spans. But it's just about how do we get into the attention of the buyer so that they want to know more from us. And then the next stage is, you know, what more do they need from us? So what's the next step? Then there's enrolling in ongoing communication and then educating our potential clients into how their problem affects them and how we can solve their problem right. until we then entice them into a sales conversation, then engage them in our services and then ultimately escalate that relationship. So my marketing process is about you know, building each of those six steps into our system so that we can nurture or you know, initially attract the attention of our ideal clients and then nurture the relationship, build the relationship until they come to us already pre-sold, ready to buy and right. you know, wanting our services so they almost demand to become a client rather than us having to convince them that they need us. Yes, no more chasing and convincing. Mm. I want to share a story with you, and this was something relative to what we're talking about here, about people mm. who are really attracted to what you do. Mm. So Peter Block, Flawless Consulting, one of the grand masters of our profession, I heard him speak at an Institute of Management Consultants conference, and he did like a pre-conference session. There's maybe 50, 60 people in a room, and he comes out, and I look at him as the Yoda of mm -hmm. the consulting profession. And he comes out with a little twinkle in his eye. He has this huge, you know, very fancy introduction and everyone's like, oh, this is the legend. Here's the man. And he says, well, thank you for that kind introduction. But really, when I look back on my 40-year career, what I've really done is I've helped a bunch of really smart leaders at great companies who didn't really need my help. And he stops and he lets that sink in and said, what does that mean? And the punchline, of course, is he's working with really great leaders at all the top companies in the world. They didn't need his help. They wanted his help. Mm -hmm. So talk about the kind of client that comes to us in a state of need or mm -hmm. desperation mm -hmm. versus more of a client that has champagne problems, right? Mm -hmm. High level problems. And they want to work with you and they aspire to work with you and they are hoping that you will accept them. Mm. Let me talk about a real life situation where I was talking to the owner of a reasonably large business. You know, they were doing about 35 million in turnover. And the owner was, you know, getting on and you know, looking towards retirement and being able to move out of the business. But they had been at that $35 million level for a number of years. I got in to talk to him and he was talking to me about his problems and the challenges. He needed help, but he wasn't convinced that I was the right person to help. He said, well, we need to do much better in our marketing. I know that's a need we have. And in fact, my marketing manager's reading a book at the moment about that and she's you know trying to learn as much as she can about our marketing so I'm not sure if you're the right person to talk to at this stage and I said oh well, what's the book she's reading and uh, he said oh it's a, a book called cracking the code I said oh uh, who's the author of that book I'm not sure I said well I think you'll find that's me <laughs> I said, why don't we get the marketing manager into our conversation and see, you know, what she thinks and, and, you know, if there's any relevance to her being involved in this process as well. Well, she came in to the meeting and said, 
wow, you're Greg Roweth. You're the author of the book I'm reading. Wow, it is such an amazing book. I'm learning so much from it. Can we talk about how you can help us? So the owner of the business needed my help. She wanted my help. I did get the gig and was able to help them. But, yeah, the contrast between someone who needs help but doesn't necessarily want the help I think is illustrated in that process. So the desire and the want for help came from the education that I'd provided through my book and by the affinity and the relationship that was already built in terms of me being seen as the saviour rather than the servant. Which yes. who I potentially was in the owner's eyes. For sure, for sure. That is so good. Yes, I know. Terrific episode here, but have you seen our latest web training? Oh my goodness, pop over there right now, or as soon as you're done listening to this episode, it's doitmarketing.com slash webinar. See you over there. Back to the good stuff. I also want to talk about this, and I mentioned it before, but this higher level problems. Because so many times, and maybe this is the fault of the copywriting industry, maybe this is the fault of the internet marketing industry, but how many emails do we get and how many pitches do we get? Are you struggling with X? Are you frustrated by Y? Are you angry that you're... And so who's that going to attract? People who are struggling, Mm -hmm. frustrated, and angry. Yeah. And so people wonder, where are the good clients? Mm -hmm. Where are the clients that can afford my fees? Is prospecting just a big myth? And then you say, well, when you're using struggler language, you attract strugglers. And again, in preparation for our chat today, Greg, all over your website, it's so brilliant. It says you're already successful, but Mm -hmm. right, you've reached a certain level and Mm -hmm. maybe your money is flowing freely, but you're like, where's my life? Where's my freedom? You know, am I ever going to be able to get out of here? So you have mastered this concept of you're not talking about struggle and frustrated. Mm -hmm. Where do I find my first leads? So you're almost repelling the beginners. You're repelling the strugglers. And the channel that you're broadcasting on is a channel of the established consultant or the established firm, Mm -hmm. which when people see that, they either are that and Mm -hmm. they resonate with it right away, or they aspire to that and they respond to that higher vibration type of messaging. Talk about how that has played in, not only to your success, Mm. but what you see on a lot of other consultants messaging about the strugglers versus the Mm. successful people. Well, you know, when I started out, I was the same as everyone else. I didn't have a clue about marketing and I got a lot of struggling clients, you know, and clients who struggled to pay me. But also I found that people at that level of struggle didn't have time or money. So their commitment to the process was limited and they often didn't get good results because they didn't apply themselves to what I was trying to teach them. I managed to get some higher level clients and found they were so much easier to work with. And they committed themselves to the process. They were happy to pay me. They got results, which meant they were even more happy to pay me and continue paying me. So I had learnt more about targeting. You know, as I realized, yeah, I want to work with clients at a higher level who already have achieved a level of success but haven't been able to crack the code, if I can use that right. <laughs> technology, to you know, move from being the business operator to being the business orchestrator. So you know, most of my clients these days are at that sort of top level of the business operator. They've got a successful business. You know, they're doing you know a million dollar revenue or or almost they've got five to ten employees but you know they're busy you know they're making good money but they're working too hard for the money and they want to grow the business they see potential in the business but just can't break through that barrier to take it to the next level so they see you know through my education marketing content that well, there is a solution to this problem. Greg has a methodology to help me get through that. So let's talk to Greg and you know, see if he can help. So when I get clients to that level, 
they're really committed to the process. They understand the challenges that they've been struggling with and they are willing to look at a solution. And often I find people at really the lower end are more sceptical in some ways. You know, they don't even recognise the depth of their problem, but they think they know the answers. You know, they still haven't perhaps gone through the challenge of trying things that don't work. So they get sucked in by all this other marketing that says, you know, you need this, you need that, you need to be posting on LinkedIn every day. You know, there's so much of that rubbish out there and people get sucked in to think, oh, well, I need to do that. So what you're telling me, you know, is not relevant to me because I want to be posting on LinkedIn or I want to write a book or I want to do this. And yeah, I do all those things. I've done those things, but there's a time and a place for those things. Right, for sure. Getting that sequencing right and getting the focus right first and what I talked about, you know, having the right strategy for business growth. And most people at a lower level, reactive and tactical in their approach. Whereas people who've been around the block a few times and understand that there's more to it, you know, they've tried a few things that didn't work. So they understand they've got to be more proactive and strategic in their approach. So yes. I'm looking for clients who understand that they need to be proactive and need to be strategic rather than reactive and tactical. Now, when we have this criteria, and most consultants, I think most professional services firms, they know who the nightmare clients are mm -hmm. and the nightmare project, and mm -hmm. they know who the amazing, wonderful clients are and the amazing, wonderful projects. Once we sit down and we write down maybe five to seven criteria, so we have that hopefully in our heads when mm. we're talking to people, we're qualifying and disqualifying. Do you recommend that they somehow externalize that criteria? And should that be on their website? Should that be on a who we work with page? I mean, to what extent do we want to turn mm. on the electromagnets for the right people and then turn around the electromagnet and repel the wrong people? Yeah, well, I think it's important to do that, to be very clear about who we work for and who we don't. And yeah, to do that externally so that everyone knows, you know, it's nothing wrong with saying to someone, well, you're not an ideal client for us. You know, we don't work with people at this level. You know, and that solves or saves a lot of time for both parties. You know, there's no need to go any further. Someone doesn't need to listen to our webinar for an hour and then find out oh, we're not the ideal client. Or even right. worse, you know, listen to a webinar, sign up for a strategy session, spend an hour in the conversation before coming to the end and say, oh, you charge too much. I can't afford you. Nobody wants that. <laughs> We've um, all been on those calls, right? You're there for an hour. Greg, mm. this all sounds fantastic. The only problem is we don't have any money. Yep. Would have been nice to not even waste the time right, right. from the start. Yeah. Well, I have found, and I am, I'm guessing that you found the same thing, that when you have criteria, it tends to attract people both who meet the criteria mm -hmm. and those who don't. Mm. So someone might call up and say, well, Greg, you know, I'm not at, you know, pick a number. You know, we're, we're not at $300,000 yet. We're not at $100,000 mm -hmm. yet. But boy, oh boy, the moment that we qualify, the moment that we cross that finish line, you're the guy I'm going to call mm -hmm. because you weren't willing to underserve them or oversell them. Mm -hmm. And they know that you're a guy that has integrity and that your firm has integrity. Yes. And in fact, I've had people at that point saying, well, we've got this credit card that we haven't used and that's really for emergencies. but..." I think I'll pay for your fees on that credit card. And, you know, I'm reluctant to take people's last money, <laughs> you know, that they you know, can't really afford to lose. However, if I'm convinced that they have what it takes and, you know, reaching into that, you know, last resource will get them the results, then I'll accept them as a client. You know, but they've got to show a level of commitment and desire and capability you know, to right. do what it takes. Otherwise, yeah, I, you know, I don't want to be you know, taking people's food out of their mouths and not <laughs> putting it back in. 
Right. So well, and clearly that's the exception to the rule. Mm-hmm. And again, that's about character, right? Yeah. That's about, are they committed? Are they 100% all in? Because I'm guessing you always do your best work, whether it's financial distress or not. Mm-hmm. Clients who are all in yeah. get the most amazing results. That's right. And, uh, you know, you do sometimes extend people the courtesy of believing that about them and sometimes they disappoint you. But, yes. you know, usually, you know, when someone's willing to make that commitment and put in the work, then you, you love working with those sort of people, you know, and maybe they're sometimes my favourite people to work with, even though I'd prefer, you know, the people who can afford me very easily and, you know, want to take their business to the next level. But there's nothing like helping someone who's a real battler, who's prepared to put in the time and the effort and do the work and get the results. And, you know, that's a great feeling to help someone in that situation. Absolutely right. Here in the U.S., we call those people, they are in it to win it. Yes. They are in it to win it. Mm -hmm. And that's always fun to have those zero to hero success stories. Mm. Well, this has been so fantastic, Greg. I know that we have some resources for people. The website, once again, is businessflightpath.com. We're going to have all of these in the show notes right below this episode. But Greg, what else would you like to leave people with? What kind of gifts, offers, resources can we leave in their hands? Well, on businessflightpath.com, there are a couple of free resources that they can access. One is an ebook called The Seven Keys to Building a Thriving Practice You Could Sell. There's another training around my strategic authority marketing process, video training that can access and also get access to another ebook called The Consultant's Guide to Attracting More Premium Clients. So you can access those from the front page, homepage of my website. You can also get access to my book, Cracking the Code, which is specifically for owners of professional service firms with five to 20 employees who want to grow their business. I have a a fee on that of $7 Australian, which is probably about $5 US at the moment. And there's some extra bonuses that add up to about $4,200 worth of additional training that they get with that $7 purchase. So That's a hugely valuable resource. If they want to go to that, they can get that through my website or specifically on a website that is called crackingthecodebook.com.au. Very nice. And we're going to, again, link up all of those links, all those resources directly under this episode at thesellingshow.com. Well, Greg Roworth, such a pleasure, such a privilege. I appreciate our time zone difference because I'm up over, you're down under. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And we have to have you back. This was, I mean, we could have talked for hours and I'm looking forward to part two. I have enjoyed that conversation immensely, David. And yes, look forward to part two as well. And that wraps up another episode of The Selling Show. Hey, tell you what, if you like us, rate us and review us on Apple Podcasts, subscribe, tell a friend, go grab the notes and downloads and extras at thesellingshow.com. See you next time.